So today is um, roughly speaking uh, about coherent chiefs on base affine space. roughly speaking. But I just want to remind you again where we're headed. So we have the M uh, antispherical, which is the categorical antispherical module. And we have a uh, coherent sheaves, G check equivariant coherent sheaves on the Springer resolution. So this is the constructible antispherical module, and this is the coherent antispherical module. And we want to establish an equivalence. Like this, this is what we want. And the key step is to, in um, Archipov Bezrukamnikov, is we look at um, co g check three n tilde. So this is the full subcategory by pullbacks of irreducible, by, by pullbacks of G modules. So V in rep G check. So this is a full subcategory inside here that determines this so this is a smooth variety, and so we can always resolve by G equivariant vector bundles, and G equivariant vector bundles are um, of this form, or at least generated by objects of this form. And so it's enough to produce a functor from, from here. And what and then we have the Remember the categorical antispherical module is a quotient of, of the, um, this is the affine, the constructible affine Hecker category. And this is a uh, monoidal. And also note that this is um, monoidal. And the key kind of most important part of this, um, the proof is to construct a monoidal functor here. So we construct And somehow the, um, the key observation, kind of philosophical observation, is that this functor, um, this functor F, is that um, F can be built kind of softly once one has the functor from rep G check to H. And this is um this is Gates Greece central functor. Okay, so somehow what I'm trying to say here is that there's this um,
highly non-trivial construction of the central functor. But then once you have this functor, somehow the key observation is that to upgrade to this object is soft in some sense. So, and now I'll explain uh, more precisely what this means. So what I want to do is spend the first kind of 20 minutes of this talk giving you a bird's eye picture of where we want to go. Then I'll spend um, the rest of this talk zooming on on one part of that. And then at some point, I wouldn't mind having a discussion how much detail you would like to see um, for the rest of this kind of formal aspect of the argument. So are there any um, questions at this level of detail? Okay, so I want to um, give a more precise version of, of F. So, is the following. So the following is absolutely key to Akipov as Rakhmetov. So theorem. Uh, Basically, what I want to do is how is explain how to provide a functor from coherent sheaves How do we provide a monoidal functor to C where C is a um, monoidal, Additive monoidal category so C is a additive Monodal category. So there's various levels of structure. So the zeroth level is we have a tensor functor from rep G check to C. Level one that we saw last time is having an endomorphism of this functor is basically upgrading this to a functor from G check mod, the Lie algebra mod G check to C. So um, if N is a tensor derivation. So remember Anthony suggested renaming tensor endomorphism to tensor derivation. And I completely agree. Uh, so if, we, if we're given a tensor derivation of our functor F, so this is, some element NV from F of V to F of V such that N of V tensor V prime is N of V tensor identity plus identity tensor N of V prime. Then this is, this gives us um, a monoidal functor from co-free um, G check mod G to C. Okay, and this roughly how this goes, I explained in the last lecture. Um, I didn't explain it entirely, but um, I explained a decent chunk of it. Um, today comes the, the now comes the subject of today's lecture, which is um, if we have a, a tensor functor from rep G check times T check to C, together with certain arrows. So this is a tensor functor. plus arrows B lambda, which go from F of the one dimensional module of highest weight lambda to the 
f of v lambda um, and these arrows should satisfy some relations and that will be the subject of this talk so-called Plucke relations and then plus um, a cyclicity which uh, I don't want to go into at the moment. Basically, this should send certain uh, certain objects to zero. F extends to um, a map from the flag variety from coherent cheese on the flag variety to C to a to a tensor functor from this is the flag variety. Okay, so I'm aware that I'm not giving all the details. This is some kind of high level. And three, um, now there's a condition. So if we think about the um, cotangent bundle of the flag variety, this is a subset inside the flag variety times G check. Okay, so if you think about it as being a flag together with an element that preserves that flag or something like that, it's a sub variety inside a product. And so now we need, need to know in order to give, give a map from coherent sheaves on, um, on um, the cotangent bundle, we need to kind of put these, the data in one and two together. So if we take the data in one and two, we get a monoidal functor from um, and now inside here we have the Springer resolution, the T star T star of B. And Three is that for this um, this data to factor over coherent sheaves on n tilde is a very simple condition. Suppose that b lambda of n of v lambda. So what's this? So b lambda. So firstly, n of v lambda takes it's an endomorphism of this guy. Right? And then uh, B lambda is a map from here to F of B lambda. F of ah, did I mess this up? Sorry, this should I messed this up. This should be go around the other way. Suppose that this map equals zero. Then. Um, this factors over okay so somehow the point of this slide um, is to say that we have this one kind of very powerful bit of input, which is this functor. And then, um, so the extra data we need to produce is this derivation, and we need to produce these arrows. We need to check some relations. And once we've done that, we get what we want. Okay. And all of this business on top of the functor F is reasonably soft. So I promise you that now we will become more concrete um, following this slide. Okay. And I wrote in my slides with a bit of luck, this will be the last kind of formalism lecture. So maybe I'll say a few more 
I'll ask you at the end how much more of this you want to see. Um, and maybe um, I'll either do another half lecture on this or just write some notes which people can read if they're interested. Um, Jody, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, in uh, the data in part two, um, you've got V lambda and K lambda. So mm -hmm. um, you're regarding, uh, and both of these are meant to be G check cross T check representations. So you're regarding mm -hmm. V lambda um, as such a representation where T check acts trivially, and you're regarding K lambda as such a representation where G check acts trivially. So. Exactly. Oops. You left out the checks on those groups and um, you also left out the tilde on n tilde in the last line of the slide. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, um, now introductions are aside. So we move back to G. So in the introduction, I wrote G check, etc. Now I'll just write G B N tilde B, etc. Okay. So I'm entirely on the, um, side of the dual group for the rest of the lecture. Okay, so um, now we come to some fun, which is, I just want to recall for the um, younger members of the audience, says description. Of coherent sheaves. On PN. And uh, so this is taken from a very famous paper called Faisal Algebraic Cohérent from 1955. And this is a very influential paper. Okay, and it's a beautiful thing to read particularly when you're learning. So if you're a student learning coherent sheaves, it's a lovely thing to read because um, you, you have the sense of a theory that's being developed. So it's very clearly exposed, but it's also one of the first times that details were written about these things. And so um, there's a level of curiosity that you don't find, for example, in Hartshorn. Uh, so what's the idea? is that um, PN has this kind of standard cover by affines. Standard affine cover. And so um, a coherent chief on Pn is the same thing as um, kind of coherent sheaves on this cover. So each ui is isomorphic to um, an affine space. And this is initially in this paper how Sarah discusses coherent sheaves on Pn. Um, so it's uh, you know, a collection. over k x one to the xn plus glue. But this is beyond about p1, this becomes a pain in the ass. I mean, annoying. Not very practical.
Um, so instead, we can make the following observation that coherent sheaves on Pn is the same thing as coherent sheaves on A n plus one without zero, that a GM equivariant for the scaling op operation. And this, so for the students, this is not entirely obvious. So don't think that there's no thought necessary here. But it turns out that you can describe this as coherent sheaves on a n plus one modulo coherent sheaves on a point on zero. Okay, so the picture is we have um, kind of Pn down here, and then we have and so a coherent chief here is the same thing as a equivariant coherent chief that's equivariant for these directions. And this is almost an affine variety. The only thing that um, makes it not affine is this missing zero point. And so if we forget what's happening at zero, we get um, an equivalence. And note that um, GM equivariant co coherent cheese on AN plus one um, is the same thing as um, kind of GM enriched um, coherent sheaves together with the compatible action of um, functions. So the GM enrichment becomes a grading and the compatible action of functions just becomes a graded module. So this is finitely generated. Uh, and so we get this description and also inside here we have um, co-GM of a point. So this, this corresponds precisely to the um, finite dimensional. Modules inside here. And so we get, this is um, says description coherent chiefs on Pn is um, finitely generated graded S modules where this is S modulo um, finite dimensional modules and this is uh, for good reason is called a SEA subcategory and this operation is called a SEA quotient. All right. So um, for the students, um, just two nice exercises, if you'd like to get used to this a little bit better. Um, this, um, this gives the right answer. So if you ask what this um, description is saying for coherent sheaves on P0, which is a point, you get a rather interesting description of vector spaces, which is 
a priori a little, a tiny bit surprising and fun. Um, so the functor from um, here to here, um, gamma can be described as hom from all the twisting sheaves. And using this description, hence describe what does a twisting sheep correspond to and what is a skyscraper. Okay, to get used to this description. Um, and just a remark, which uh, following our lunch discussion yesterday, we can view We can view both of these descriptions through the lens of descent. Uh, so firstly, if we cover PN by these UIs, we get the um, kind of the not very useful description. Okay, so if we use a kind of more classical cover, but if we look at, so um, in previous lectures and also at lunch yesterday, we were discussing this kind of Sarah Grothendieck insight that we should consider, we should drastically enlarge what we consider it to be a cover. Um, and this cover leads to um, Sarah's description. So, this, this space is almost affine and therefore kind of easy for coherent sheaves and this leads to Sayre's description. Alrighty. So are there any questions on this business? So basically, uh, just for motivational purposes, um, what we'll do is we'll see a, a, similar at a similar description of coherent sheaves on flag varieties using so-called base affine space. Uh, Okay, so I gave an example of how to give a um, give a coherent sheaf on PN by sorry, not a coherent sheaf, a, a sheaf of categories on PN using the um, this using Sayre's description. Um, it's a pretty straightforward generalization of the example of A1 mod GM that I gave last week, so maybe I won't go through this, and I'll move straight to G mod B. Okay, so how do we describe coherent sheaves on G mod B? And note that this discussion intersects with the previous discussion in the case of SL2, where we where G mod B is P1. So there's at least three options. There's via covers. And this is not very useful. Okay, so the combinatorics of the covers of PN that are 
you, you can make them explicit. Whereas the combinatorics of the Bruja covers of, um, of flag varieties, you cannot make explicit as far as I know. Um, a second option, which um, is very useful, is to use this equivalence. So use the induction equivalence. And this is um, only works in the equivariant case. But I have some vague suspicion that um, that some chunks of what I'll, I'll, I'll be explaining this week and perhaps next week can be simplified if you make more use of this description. Um, but that's to be investigated. And the third option is um, via base affine space. And this is the analog of Sayre's description. Okay, so what is base affine space? So as we'll see in a second, it's never affine or um, almost never affine. So it's a strange name. Um, I once asked Ginsburg why it was called base affine space and he said, because um, it's to all in, in, intents and purposes affine. Um, but just keep in mind that's not. Uh, it's, so we'll see in a second, it's quasi affine. So, uh, Jordi, yes? when we say describe, um, so what sort of general thing do we have in mind? So what I mean is like, so you wrote down this description of the equivariant one, and then previously you had told us that we can de-equivariantize an equivariant thing and get the whole thing. So, uh -huh. um, but presumably that way of description is not good enough for you. Um, so, I'm just wondering. Basically, what we want to know is an efficient way of giving a functor from, um, from G equivariant coherent sheaves on G mod B to somewhere. Um, and basically the, the criteria that this should be sat, should satisfy, should satisfy is we should be able to do it in an example, in this example of the affine Hecker category. Um, and so Archipov, Bezor, Kavnikov managed to do that using the base affine space, but it's totally possible that you could do it via um, de-equivariantizing the second description. And, um, and I kind of suspect that that's possible um, and maybe make some of the following more natural, but I only started thinking that the last few days. Um, so I'm kind of saying the middle arrow, um, it, it won't really be mentioned again in this, in this talk, but um, I think it's a mistake to forget it. And I guess just another kind of point here is how on earth do we think about a coherent chief on G mod B? You know, there's various different ways of thinking about it and it's useful to keep them all in mind. In gen not, not just for the purposes of these co this course, but in general. Okay, so base affine space. I hope that is um, at least some approximation of an answer. Uh, so U is the unipotent radical of B. And uh, base affine space is G mod U. And note that it has a natural projection to the flag variety G mod B. 
And the first thing to note is that G acts on the left of G mod U, and this is an equivariant map, but also it has a commuting action of T on the right via um, G U T is G T U. And this uh, makes sense because T normalizes U. And probably the most important thing for, for our purposes is that G mod U mod T is isomorphic to G mod B. So that's the first thing that's very important for our purposes. So um, this is the analog of the fact that a to the n plus one without zero mod c star is pn. So this gives us our, our space. And the second most, the second very important point is that this is kind of almost affine, just like a to the n plus one without zero. Um, so just an example. For g equals SL2, SL2 acts on C2 and the stabilizer of 1, 0 is, which is the unipotent radical. So hence, uh, G mod U is isomorphic to the orbit of 1, 0, which is isomorphic to C2 without 0. And the right T equals C star action corresponds to the scaling action. So it's enough to know how it, because it commutes with the G action, it's enough to know how it acts on the, um, on one zero, and then it just acts by scaling. So this is the scaling action. Equals here, and of course, this is our this is our example of one of the Sayre cases that C two. So B is P one. Is C two without zero? What C star? Okay. Ah, so yes, almost. So Peter just asked, does almost affine have a concrete me meaning? And that is the next line, which is that um, in general, G mod U is quasi affine. So this means open in an affine. Okay, so it sits as an open subset inside spec of something. Uh, da, da, da. So why is it quasi-affine? There's a number of different ways of thinking about uh, base affine space. One useful way is that if, so V lambda is a simple highest weight module, and V lambda in V. So I'll need this notation later. This is a fixed highest weight vector. So I regard all the V lambdas that appear in this talk as kind of polarized or um, pinned down by the choice of a highest weight vector. Uh, and if lambda, if, if lambda is strictly dominant, then the stabilizer in G of V lambda is U. So hence, G 
Gmod U embeds inside B lambda via GU goes to GB lambda. And uh, uh, my, my imagination of this is kind of, here I have V lambda, and then there's some cone-like thing. And then, um, G mod U is an open, open set inside this, um, this um, cone. Uh, I'm worried now. Do I need to take a direct sum of different highest weight modules to get this to be an embedding? Because this, th what I said, the stabilizer being U won't be correct because it'll factor through a character of the torus. Ah, okay, so we should. Um, so that's false. If we take um, we take enough copies, V lambda one plus V lambda two plus V lambda M the stabilizer of V lambda one, V lambda M is U. Does that seem right to somebody? Um, it seems much healthier to me. So that is wrong in the notes. Apologies for that. Uh, so that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is, um, so it's, it's, some, it's some kind of cone inside a, a big representation of G. Another way to think about it that I'll just say verbally is as a moduli space of flags plus the choice of a vector in, so, of a Borel subalgebra plus a, a choice of a vector in um, the Borel mod its commutator. And this vector should have trivial stabilizer under the torus. It's kind of moduli interpretation. Uh, another very important fact is that the, its ring of functions is known and very beautiful and explicit. So that's what I'll come to next. Are there any questions based on this? Uh, sorry, so was Peter's question answered? I, I somehow missed the punchline. So you got an embedding into an affine space and then you wanted to say that this is almost. Yeah. So this closure, is a, um, this is a closed subset inside an affine space. And so this is affine. And so this is quasi affine. Okay, so now um, we'll do the ring of functions. So 
So by the Peter Weil theorem, and remember that the characteristic of K is zero, the functions on G as a G times G representation decompose overall. So this is as G times G reps. So hence, um, we're in some kind of dreamland for functions on G mod U. So this is a um, I mean, this is a free quotient, um, and so we can just work this out by taking the U invariance for the right action. And so that's a direct sum over V lambda, tensor of V lambda. So here, the, the left G only acts on this factor, the right G only acts on this factor. So U only acts on this factor. And we all know that taking U invariance in a simple highest weight module is a nice operation. So the functions on base affine space are very simple. It's just a direct sum of V lambda. And moreover, uh, the uh, right T action, so we have T acts on here. Um, and T axon here via character lambda. I got a bit confused this morning with um, jewels and things, but it's either this or the or the kind of transpose character, and I don't really worry what what I worry about that. So. What about multiplication? I remember when I first, I can't remember whether I first realized this or someone explained it to me or something and I just couldn't believe how, how nice it is. So we want to describe um, multiplication. So it's enough to describe maps from But the really beautiful thing is that this is T equivariant. So hence maps, the multiplication map maps V, v lambda tensor V mu to V lambda. And now this is G equivariant. And we know that this is V lambda plus mu plus lower stuff. So hence the home space is one dimensional. So there exists a unique map M lambda mu from V lambda tensor V mu to V lambda mu that sends V lambda, our fixed highest weight vector times V mu to V lambda plus mu. And this is the multiplication. Or is or determines Okay, so that's, uh, so I think people call this the Chevalet product. At least that's what I've stored this in my mind as. Um, 
And also there's, you can give a similar description of the multiplication of functions on G. Um, as the Chevalier product. So somehow the, although the functions on, on base affine space are somewhat complicated, we, we, can, we can encode them basically combinatorially using the representation theory of chi. Um, just an example to keep us honest. If G is SL2, then functions on the base affine space. So we saw that it's B la lambda for lambda bigger than or equal to zero, but we also know what the functions on um, A2 without zero are. They are simply um, homogeneous functions in two variables. And this decomposition is of course the decomposition into homogeneous, homogeneous components. And then the um, multiplication So you can characterize the multiplication as being the unique um, G equivariant map. So, ah, I realize that I'm um, almost out of time. I mean, I am out of time by four minutes. But just for the rest of the talk, I'll introduce the following notation. So we have um, G mod U is open and dense inside G mod U bar. So this is the affine closure, which is the spec of KG mod U. And um, we should think that this is kind of anal analogous to A to the N plus one without zero. And this is analogous to A to the N plus one. So um, coherent sheaves on this are almost the same as coherent sheaves on this.
I just want to kind of explain where these um, kind of weird looking arrows come from from last time. So this is a um, motivational interlude. So we have a, we've just seen that K KG mod U or KG mod U bar is the direct sum of V lambdas. Um, and the de-equivariantization principle says that to give C the category, a, a structure over um, G mod B, which we're secretly thinking of, I mean, totally not secretly, we're not, we're very much thinking of in an overt sense as G mod U mod T is the same as giving So I'll write on the left-hand side what the de-equivariantization principle um, tells us in general. So it tells us that we should have, I mean, on the left, I'll write, um, so we should have a rep T action on C. Um, so this is kind of the data over point mod T. That's just motivation. Um, and this is the same thing as um, in the particular case of, so rep T is simply the uh, monoidal category associated to a lattice, to, to the lattice of characters. So this means a chi action is equal to the characters of T action on C which sends some object C to C lambda. Okay, so the action of characters of the torus is just the same thing as a strict action of a lattice. And then we have So I'll I'll start calling this thing O following Roman. Uh, we have a T equivariant O linear structure on C D equivariantized with respect to this T action. So remember, this is a way of taking a category acted on by rep T and producing a category acted on by T. And so now it makes sense to say that it's T equivariantly O linear. And this, um, in general, just means that we're given a, um, for all we're given a map from O to HOM from C to the functions on T act acting on which in this particular case is just the same thing as HOM from C to the direct sum. So the functions on T, the direct sum of its characters, C lambda, T equivariant, Okay, so that's the general blah, blah, blah of the equivariantization. That's what, what's, this is our recipe for giving a linear structure over something of the form blah mod a group. Um, but what does this mean in this concrete, in, in this particular case, we have a very concrete description of what O is. So namely, we just need to give a whole lot of maps from B 
the lambda to home C to C, uh, C lambda. So this is probably too fast, but this has to be a T equivariant map. And the T equivariant, the lambda isotopic component on this side is V lambda, and the lambda isotopic component on this side is this piece. So this is the so if we call this phi, phi C, C prime, this is the lambda isotypic component of phi C, C prime. And this is the same thing as giving an element an arrow from, I mean, I'm not sure what the right way to think about this, but I think about this as I can move this V lambda across here and replace it with its dual. And then I can move it into here and then I can move it back across. I'm not sure if that's the best way of thinking about it. But anyway, you could convince yourself that this is the same thing as giving a map from V lambda tends to C to C lambda. So this is called B lambda. And this is what um, Roman likes to call the highest weight arrow. Such that um, the Chevalier relations are satisfied such that we get an algebra homomorphism. And this is um, this becomes encoded in something called the Plucker relations or the Drinfeld Plucker relations. Um, Okay, so, and then three, this gives us C over um, G mod U bar, the affine closure mod T, and then if certain coherent sheaves, i.e. those supported on the complement of G mod U bar mod G mod U act by zero, then we get what we want. Okay, so this is meant to be a kind of another like slightly higher level um, picture of what's going on and I just wanted to motivate where these um, funny looking arrows from the second slide come from. So now uh, more detail. Jordi can I just ask um, sure so you're missing some primes on C's um, in the codomain of B lambda for instance. Uh, thank so you. So, um, so on the first slide um, what you were calling B lambda was slightly different from this, but I guess um, this, the new arrows are meant to be natural in um, C and C prime. Exactly. So they somehow arise from the sort of B lambda that you had before. Yeah, so um, the B lambda before we should think of as a, as a, as a morphism of functors from tensoring with V lambda with tensoring with K lambda. Mm -hmm. And that would be the same data as what I'm writing down here. So in the, sorry, yeah. So I see what you're saying. So in the first slide, C was a monodal category. And here we're thinking about C from the first slide should be the endomorphisms of C in this slide. 
So that is confusing as hell, so I'll change it. Okay. So, remark. So this arrow would be an arrow from tensoring with V lambda to tensoring with K lambda. Which I can either phrase as a natural transformation between functors or an arrow between these functors um, in, the, in the morphisms. Okay, so now I just want to um, go into a little bit more detail about what these um, grinfeld plucker relations are, and then state the kind of analog of the final. Last time we had a statement that to give, um, to upgrade something to G check mod, to, to the Lie algebra mod G is the same thing as giving an endomorphism. I want to make the corresponding um, statement in this context. So, and just maybe a high level remark is that um, everything is very formal um, to get this functor, but checking this acyclicity, the fact that certain coherent sheaves act as zero, there we really need to get into the guts of what's going on. Um, and so that will, that will take place. So um, we're almost done with the formalism side of things. Um, and so we'll get some functors from kind of some affine things, but then to actually check that they give us functors from, um, that they kind of restrict from, uh, to coherent cheese on some open piece, um, we'll need much more detail. Uh, okay, so arrows between coherent cheese on G, on, um, on G mod U. So I want to give a little bit more detail about these Drinfeld flicker relations. Uh, So as before, O is K G mod U is the direct sum over V lambda. And we have the Chevalier multiplication M lambda mu. Um, so we have this multiplication plus we have a chi grading. Okay. So now, um, we want to look at um, home. So this should be as um, as G times T equivariant vector bundles or equivalently G times T equivariant maps between O modules from uh, V lambda tensor O to O lambda, so O twisted by lambda. So this is the same thing as homomorphisms, uh, which are just G times T equivariant. From V lambda to O lambda. And now, uh, the only, um, so the, the zero weight space here is the V lambda weight space. So it's like um, G equivariant from V lambda to V lambda, which is just C. 
Okay, so the G equivariant maps between these vector bundles are very, very simple, the G times T equivariant. And these are spanned by um, these arrows, which are kind of take on a lot of significance, which are just defined by the Chevalier multiplication. So, um, okay, so in order to define this arrow, it's enough to um, say what it does on its homogeneous components. And this is just the Chevalier multiplication. Okay, and these are called um, highest weight arrows. So there's an equivalent, a, a pretty equivalent way of looking at this whole picture in which you look at just B equivariant sheaves on a point, so representations of B. Um, this was what I was discussing some slides back. And in this world, these, um, these arrows are um, literally like projection onto highest weight spaces or lowest weight spaces. So the lemma is that these, um, these arrows satisfy the Plücker relations, the drinfeld plücker relations. which is the following statement. So for the last week, I've um, been trying to kind of piece together this argument in Roman's paper, so these relations have be become a little bit ingrained on my skull. Um, so what do they mean? So what's B lambda tensor B mu? This is a map from B lambda tensor O to V mu tensor O. And this lands in O lambda tensor over O O mu. And here I have the multiplication O lambda plus mu. But alternatively, I can view this. And so, oh, and I can go via M lambda mu to V lambda plus mu. And so, oh, and then up here I have my V lambda plus mu. So that is this diagram commutes. And the proof um, is easy. So this, these are maps of O modules, so it's enough to check
Okay, so if I take V lambda tensor one, tensor V mu tensor one, I get a copy of V lambda tensor mu. And then if you look at where this goes, Um, the diagram becomes the following. So this is M lambda mu. Yeah, it just it just becomes the definition of the the diagram becomes the definition of the Chevalier multiplication. So somehow these drinfeld plucker relations are just encoding in, term, in this tensor category the relations in a ring. Um, so a question for the um, educated audience is, um, does anyone know a good reference for drinfeld plucker formalism? So there's various things with uh, to do with vector bundles and in this kind of world where um, I arrive at some mysterious statement and someone tells me, oh, this is just drinfeld plucker formalism. It's happened to me about 10 times, um, but I can never isolate the uh, anything where this is really explained what's going on here. Um, and Google searches don't really help. So I can kind of check some of this stuff by hand, but it doesn't, um, I don't see where the general pattern, for example, why on earth is Plucker's name associated with this? Sorry, that's just the Plucker embedding, yeah? Uh, why do you say that? Why do I say that? That's a good question. Same thing as when you embed a product of projective spaces. To, which, which way does it go? When you, when you embed a projective space to a bigger projective space? I mean, for me, the Plucker relations are the equations defining the Grassmannian inside in its Plucker embedding. Y yes, I think that, that that's correct. I think, it's, isn't this the same? Uh, pro so we're trying to, we're describing the image of G mod, a minimal parabolic inside um, the projectivization of some. Right. Uh, okay, so you're saying that if I do the analog of the base affine space and I'll get a whole lot of equations here. That's correct, yes. Ah, uh, okay. That's already informative for me. That's, I think, where it comes from. Okay, so roughly speaking, I should be able to say that these mysterious relations describing embeddings of flag varieties and partial flag varieties are somehow encoded in the representation ring of the group. That's so. correct, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so the following is the analog. So uh, yeah, so these Drinfeld plucker relations are, are burnt into my skull, probably not into yours yet, um, unless you've uh, work on this stuff before um, but I just want to give you the analog of the um, statement from last time upgrading so last time
we did this kind of point mod g to g mod g upgrade. And basically this upgrade was given by some tensor derivation. And um, now we do the analog for a point mod g to a g mod mod t ah, upgrade. And as I've said a number of times, then there's something really uh, not obvious to check that um, our upgrade actually can be viewed inside um, G mod G mod U mod T. And that then just becomes G equivalent achieves on the flag variety. And then when we put these two together, we get um, coherent sheaves on the cotangent model. Okay, so this is the proposition. So A is a G times T algebra. And suppose for all lambda, for all dominant weights, we're given a G equivariant map B lambda from V lambda tensor A to A lambda. Um, satisfying relations. Then so following Anthony's comment we can also think about this as being um, if we look at endo functors of um, G equivalent coherent sheaves on A then this will be encoded by some endo functor of tensoring with V so, so not some endo functor some morphism of functors from tensoring with V with tensoring with this one dimensional module of highest weight lambda. Then there is a unique um, G times T equivariant homomorphism O to A such that the push forward of this arrow. So this is Roman's notation and it means um, such that these highest weight arrows here push forward to the highest weight arrows here. Okay. So, um, so basically what we're saying here is that a certain endo functors of this action, of the action of G and T um, actually provide an algebra homomorphism. Okay, I'll, um, I'll just quickly go over the proof and then I'll conclude. So what does this last condition mean? So it means that we have a commutative diagram. So here we have B lambda tensor O going to O lambda. Here's our big, big um, 
our original highest weight arrow. And now we have V lambda tensor O. Oops. V lambda tensor A going to A lambda. And we have our map phi, so we can twist our map by lambda. And we can also tensor our map uh, V lambda tensor phi. And what it, so it means that this diagram commutes But um, if we look, if we restrict this diagram to V lambda, then V lambda maps down here to V lambda. It maps across here by phi um, by phi to to the lambda isotopic component. So this just tells us that um, that the if if we look at what B lambda does, if so this says that if we look at our arrow up here that we've been given and restrict it to V lambda tensor one, then this already determines our map phi. So this means that phi is unique if it exists. Okay, so we define phi lambda to be the restriction of B lambda to B lambda tensor one, what it has to be if it's gonna work. And we define phi to be the direct sum of all these phi lambdas. And now um, check slash see the notes. I mean, it's just, it's a few lines is to check that um, phi is a homomorphism if and only if um, Trinfeld Plücker relations. Here we're for at some point we said let's forget about the GM action. Mm. And uh, can you remind us what does that correspond to on the constructible side? Uh, Frobenius. So we're base changing to k bar, or or actually I, uh, I'm not sure what base field you're working on. But anyway, we're we're not worrying about mixed business. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, and actually in Akipov, Bezra, Kamnikov, they show a kind of compatibility with Frobenius, but they don't, they don't actually prove a, um, so in, in AB, there is no proof that um, if we add GM here, we can add mixed over here. Right. So uh, now, Let's leave leave unmixed. Let's consider unmixed. So mm -hmm. no GM. And so then is this MAS the antispherical? So is the is then the we can we then think of the Hecke category as its first approximation? Or is that still not right? Uh, exactly. Yeah, no, that's perfect. 
Okay, so this is the geometric incarnation now, sort of. Yes. Um, okay, and the and the antispherical module. So, so in other words, H for us now for the moment is the Iwahori equivariant sheaves on G mod I over an algebraically closed field, and um, the antispherical is the is the Iwahori Whittaker sheaves on the affine flag, is it? Or Yeah, so I need to go over that still. So at the moment, all we've seen is the incarnation of this as a quotient of um, yeah. Iwahori sheaves mod, mod certain guys. And then I'll, I will explain at some point um, it, that what you're saying is correct, that it also has another very nice manifestation as Whittaker sheaves, as Iwahori Whittaker. Okay. Um, and how, so eventually you're going to tell us, or are you also going to skip that, that adding the GM is the same as, like corresponds to putting the mix, or is that too technical? Uh, I would love to explain it. Um, we, we will see. Okay. I will definitely state it at some point. Um, but at least maybe, if not in this complicated setting, maybe in a simpler setting, just why is adding GM, you know, corresponds to, that's one toy example, so that we just... Um, so I can definitely, definitely at some point, um, I would like to give a lecture, which is the kind of Zergel bimodule incarnation of the Hecker category, because I think that's useful for about five people in the audience. Um, and there, it's very easy to see why adding the GM is... Um, keeping the mixed. So that's a very useful toy model. Also, I'm starting to have a lot of fun now with this because it's starting to become, uh, I'm, I'm learning quite a lot every week. So um, that might also mean a rather drastic reduction in comprehensibility, but. Yeah. So, um... This is a, so, so the proof of this um, Bezukovica theorem is, um, as you said, why are realizing it at, on, on these categories. So, um, you know, can one uh, also prove geometric Satake this way by looking at the... No, it's like everything is built on top of the existing proof of geometric Satake. Because it's really... Because there we also have the Iwahori Whittaker sheaves, right? Um, uh, we have it. We have a antispherical module for the Sataki category as well, don't we? Yes. So one could sort of hope that one can use that module category module to understand the. Um, Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but all current proofs uh, don't do that. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a super nice. Um, so the key statement in the in that lot in the um, BGMRR Bezukovikov, Merkovich, Gatesbury, Ryderish is that the Iwahori induction functor is fully, the Iwahori Whittaker induction functor is fully faithful. Um, and that's somehow what makes everything work, but to get that, they use that they already know everything about GMH Sutaki in, in, in principle. Mm -hmm. But if you could get that statement earlier, then um, you would be cooking on gas, I think, and you could perhaps reprove repro GMH Sutaki and things like that. Although there is this uh, like derived version of geometric Satake and mm -hmm. uh, which we don't know yet in the modular case. And I think like Roman and Roman et al is proposing to prove it by the method, like make it act on the Iwahori Whitaker version and then try to deduce it from that. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Another kind of fantasy that, um, it's been crossing my mind the last few weeks is that like 
this Akipa Bezrek Kamnikov passage is very much from the kind of, you know, like you identify certain structures in the coherent world and then find the analogs in the constructible world and then argue that you have enough and you can build up everything. But it would be really beautiful to work out what kind of structures, like what are the key arrows in the um, constructible affine Hecker cat category? And, um, you know, can we map back across the other way? Like, you know, is there a soft argument for a, um, for a functor from here to here, for example? And then argue, oh, it factors and 